um okay. take it away I'll do it. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this workshop. You um, are here for learning about functions and are you are in the right place. I'm Stephanie and I'll be uh, leading our, our workshop today. Um, I'm a data scientist. I've been in data science practice for a number of years, probably in in form like in industry practice for six years. Um, and then previously I was in academia working in data science related uh, work before that at the University of Chicago and at DePaul University. Um, I currently work at a firm called Saturn Cloud where we build Python tools. Sorry, <laughs> but I, I love R and it's my first programming language and definitely my favorite. And so I'm really excited to get to talk about functions with you guys today. Um, if you want to find me on GitHub or Twitter or on my website, you have the links on the screen in front of you. And if you uh, visit my Twitter, you'll see the first pinned tweet is linked to a copy of these very slides. And there is uh, all the materials for this are public on GitHub, so you should be able to uh, get in there and get your hands on anything that you might need. Um, as we move along, let me show you a little bit about what we're going to be, how we're going to be facilitating today. First, I'm going to be talking at you for a bit. I promise that it won't be too tedious or dull. I have inserted, you know, humor as much as possible because functions in their rawest form can be a little dry. Um, but then we're going to break out. Uh, we have, I think, six breakout plans um, for the course of today's session. So I'll talk a little bit about concept and then you'll pick a breakout group. Right now we have four group rooms set up and you'll get to choose whatever you feel is the right fit for you. Two beginner breakout rooms and two advanced breakout rooms. For advanced, you're going to be uh, working through a code of your own. So that's the sort of where I would put you go if you have an idea for something you might want to write into a function, but you'll we'll get to talk more about that in a minute. Um, their breakout group, their beginner one and two and advanced one and two, they're not like more beginner or more advanced or more or less beginner. They're all like just beginners or advanced. Um, this is where the GitHub repo is that has all of the code. Um, it will also be shown on the screen by the facilitators who are in the breakout rooms. So if you don't want to go bother with the repo, that's okay too, but you're welcome to clone it and follow along with that. Then um, we have lovely support team um, for questions. Ola, Camille, and Janani will be your tech support. Oh, what's going on? Don't know what I'm doing help group. And then uh, Sneha, Sam, Kayla, and other Stephanie will be leading the breakout rooms. And I'll be bumping around and you know dropping in as needed, as answering questions via chat and that kind of thing during the breakouts. So if you have any questions, if anything goes horribly wrong, we got you covered and um, feel free to hit the chat or the individual um, support folks that I mentioned. Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, yes. And so um, just to to um, get into talking a little bit about the breakouts, you'll be working through some examples that I've written for you in some small groups. So about five minutes per, per breakout session is my plan. If it f turns out that we get to five minutes in a particular session and nobody is done and things are going way longer than expected, then we can definitely extend it. The time is, is flexible. Um, in the beginner group, I've written the code, some code, and I'm going to say, here's the code, make, you know, and there are questions and sort of discussion topics around the code. For advanced, I'm going to give you a shell of a function and I'm going to say, okay, put some of your own code in there, and then we'll gradually, as the breakouts move forward, you'll add pieces to your function to make it a fully formed function that can be used by other people and that kind of thing. So if you um, don't have any idea of, of code that you might want to add into a function for the advanced group, it's okay. You can, you can try and make something up as you go. Talk to other people in the advanced group. If you feel like you, you have at least the foundations, you don't need to, to go with beginner. So it's flexible. If you choose beginner in the first breakout and you're like, this is way too easy for me, I'm going to move up, that's fine. You can change your, your, your situation. Similarly, if you get into the advanced group, you're like, well, what is this? Move back down. Okay. All right. So I believe that, that is all of the administrative paperwork sort of situation that we need to deal with. So let's talk about a function. So the 
concept of a function is not a, obviously, I think, I think you're probably well aware, not limited to R at all. It's really a concept that comes into any programming language that you'll come across. Functional programming is a concept that you'll hear about as sort of the, a, a school of programming that is maybe uh, one of many choices for how programming languages can even be structured. Like the idea of the function as the, you know, sort of worker chunk of code that you use over and over in lots of different places is very common. So the general concept, and this is also if you're is coming out of this from sort of a like mathematics background or anything like that, this should make a lot of sense. It's you start with an element, you apply some sort of mutation, transformation, something to that element, and then you return a new element that is related to the original. So it's the function of the original thing. We're going to talk about this in more practical concept sort of terms in a few minutes but the the gist that i want to make clear is that the function is really just the the instructions for what tasks you want done to the input so we get an argument is what we'll talk we'll, we'll call these arguments and returns not inputs and outputs but you get the the input element the argument you're going to do some task that is uh that it has a, been impacted by the argument or is related to the argument or does something about the argument. And then you're going to get something new out of that that you can use for a variety of whatever you're going to do next. Um, so we'll talk about a whole bunch of different caveats to this general concept that I'm explaining. But when you talk about a function, that's really what you mean. Take one thing, do magic, get another thing. All right. So why would you want to do this in R or in anything else? It's a valid question. Um, one of the things that people often talk about is that you don't want to be very repetitive with your code. You don't want to write a long you know, chunk of code that does a whole bunch of manipulations on the first column, and then you run write the whole thing over again to run it on the second column. Or you've got object A and you want to do you know, magic this and that, and then you want to do the same eh, this and that on B. You, if you write the function once, you can refer to it by its name, and then you'll just say, take object A, do this magic, magic named X, whatever, and then take object B, do magic named X, and you'll get the outputs without having to re-explain to your code what all of the instructions in the magic function are. It's also really nice to be able to share the code that you've written with other people. And if you have a function with the extra flash that we're going to talk about here regarding documentation and notes and things like that, you can share code with other people in a way that's going to be useful to them. And if you're in a business setting, this is incredibly helpful because if I want to write the process for, you know, generating the Jones report or whatever, I can use functions to create that and then hand it off to Bob next door and say, you don't need to rewrite the whole thing to create the Robinson report. I'll just give you the stuff that I used to make the Jones report and you can just use it or you can edit it to your liking. You're also really going to need functions when you start building packages. And I know that you have a uh, male Samic coming in to talk about packages next month. That's going to be awesome. I'm very jealous of you. You're going to need these functions and you're going to need the concepts or these functions to do that because the, the step is take your code wrap it up in a function so it's a nice to easy to use sort of unit and then tie that together with other little functions and then a package develops so this is the smallest unit that you need to have in order to then start developing a package we're not going to get into anything around object oriented classes or anything like that today that's way outside the purview of this but we're going to get into the idea of a unit of code that's useful for you, but accessible and easy to understand and comprehensible to others as well. And eventually ready to be packaged up into a nice, you know, library or package that then you can share open source to the community or wherever you might want to put it. All right. So when we're talking about a function in R, this is the architecture that we're thinking about. We've got a function call at the very top. So the function parentheses is literally saying, 
hey, I'm about to write, uh, th this, is, this is giving you the, the concept that this is going to be a function. And then inside the parentheses, you'll put arguments. And then you put in your code. Whatever's going to happen to those arguments, that's what you dump, dump in here after you've listed the arguments. Curly brace is important. And then a return. Return is optional, but recommended. And we'll talk about why it's optional a little later. Then you've named it my function. So once you've called it my function, now you can call that back because that's the name of your little bit of code that you've decided to write. And then you just tell it what arguments you want and then you go. So it might look like this. So say A and B are your arguments. Inside, you're multiplying A and B and creating C and you're returning C. This is obviously a really silly example because you could just write A times B and then you would save yourself a bunch of lines of code, but bear with me. Then when you're calling it back, here I'm explicitly saying, this is what A is, this is what B is. So now you're in the inner guts of your function are like, okay, I know what A is and I know what B is, so now I can do this stuff and I can return the desired effect. If you don't name what the arguments are, so if I said my function two comma four friends, it would work, it would be fine. And in most cases, when you're more advanced with using functions, you'll probably just do that. You probably already do, and maybe don't even really think about it when you're using, you know, things in the tidyverse or whatever. We'll talk a little bit later about order and making sure that your function knows what it, what you're giving it, and it gets what you think it, you're getting, and that kind of thing. But for starting out, I think it's helpful to just remember you can name those arguments and make sure that you're not like getting B and A switched. Obviously here, it doesn't matter, multiplication. But in some cases, in many cases, it will matter and you won't want to make, you won't want the function to be misinterpreting you. But this is a fully working function. Basic gives you the gist of what we're talking about. So we are already going to move in to a practice. So there is, a, in this repo, you've got the link at the top of the slides, as well as on my Twitter account many other places and I think it's been shared go ahead and open the script you're going to get into your breakout groups and you're going to have the script possible dog part one on screen and for beginners I want you to read the little sample function at the top think about what it does talk to each other about what this code is and what it means and like what you would add to it you know get creative think a little bit about the, the concept but in the advanced group I've got a shell of a function so just the you know the outer bits and you can add your own code into this function structure and change the name of it. And then we'll move on and we'll add more as we go. So everybody should be able to go ahead and pick your breakout and get move on. I'm going to have a timer go on here on the screen. Let's make sure this works. Yay. So I'll broadcast to everybody when it's time to, to get back to, to the group. Um, but off we go. Let's try it. Sorry, you might have already said the TA assignments. Did we decide who's going where for which of these breakout rooms? I don't think we did. But I think you can just uh, decide among yourselves. Yeah, and where are how do we how do we pick the breakout room? So in the That's menu, a good question. In the menu, you should see breakouts. <laughs> oh, awesome! Thank you. Breakout Got rooms it. unassigned twenty it looks like. How do you join? Because I'm trying to choose the room and it doesn't give me any option. So if you click on the room, you should see a small join that pops up after you click on the room. On the right you can either join an, a beginner or an intermediate one. Looks like, on it looks like we've got, got more choosing the beginner groups at this point, so um, we might... I don't yeah. even have the option to join that you're supposed to get. Yeah, me either. Mm -hmm. Oh. Since the really beginning, I'm trying over to the, the title of the room and then move to the right side of okay. the name. It will. Yes. Give... Oh. Yes. So if you don't have the option to join, it could be that your version of Zoom is very old, 
And so if you want to indicate in the chat which room you want to be put into, um, we can help you with this. Can yeah. Put you in. Uh, TAs, uh, is anyone in beginner one already? Uh, say hi. Oh, say hi. Like, okay. I'm looking at it. I can see her. Yeah. Great. And then I can, yeah, so I can take beginners. Oh, someone's already in beginner two. Uh, leader, no, she's not. Never mind. Okay, I'll take beginner two. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sam and Kayla, could you take advanced one and advanced two? Yeah, I can take that. I think I have the old version of Zoom. So right now it just says I need to wait to be assigned. Okay, I can assign so, you. All right. I'll jump into beginner two just to. Okay. So the rest of you who are here, should I assume that? Wait, why am I assuming? Narayana, beginner two. Okay. Okay. As there you... goes Narayana. Emily, Fira, Jennifer, Priyanka, Anway. Are you having trouble joining the breakout rooms? Please tell us where you want to be put and we'll put you there. Okay. okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna Jennifer wants to be in beginner one. And okay. Naranyana in Narayana has been moved. Okay. I'm going to put Firat in beginner one. Vedang in beginner one to balance out beginner two. <laughs> Okay. We should also probably join one of those rooms and take a peek at what's happening. Do we have a TA for advanced two? Yes, Kayla's there. Okay. And Sam is an advanced one. So you might need another person in beginner one, yeah, but someone should stay in the main room just in case other people join. Um, okay, I can hop in beginner one. Sounds good. Uh, Warda, you're just joining us. Um, everyone is um, working on our first exercise. Um, you can see the get link to the GitHub repo in the chat. Um, here, I'll post it so that you can. I'll post it to you here so that you can see it. Um, there you go. Oops, wrong um, email. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I can move on. Yeah, here. Um, oh, hang on. Let me just. We need to probably figure out where he wants to be and show him. Throw. Show them the. Um, okay. Oops, that didn't work again. Um, Janani, do you mind uh, pasting the um, link? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, because I don't think they can see it again. I'm just retaining whatever I last copied from my own personal laptop, which isn't helpful. Yeah, so we're working on the first exercise, possible dog one, and there are four breakout rooms, um, depending on what level of R user you feel like you are, um, beginner one, two, or advanced one or two. Um, just um, select that breakout room that you'd like to be in, but if you're not able to select a breakout room, you can also um, indicate in the chat and we'll um, put you in the right room. Nani, I'll hop into breakout room one just to see how it's okay. going. All right. Do I need to put you there? Or are you okay joining? Oh, I'm okay joining. Okay. Sounds good.
it, it knows R knows to look in this directory for the file that I'm um, suggesting. And then your source, rather than being um, a directory, is actually a file, like a .r file. And so this possible dog part one is what I've set as the source. And so um, your function dog check lives in this file. And so R knows that I might be calling um, functions that live in this source file. Um, so for example, technically get an, a, a silent return on functions in R, but like I said, we, we shouldn't go there. Let's not do it. It's not a good thing. No, I will. I, will, I have on my note, return is a good practice. So <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jump into. Um, I made a just like a. I have so many screens open. I'm trying to pick which one to share. Uh, I think it's dropping into to peek. Someone else can do it. Ask questions. Anyone have questions right now? I think we're just going over, um, starting to go over everyone's functions now. Wonderful. Okay. An image of like a random scatter of dots, um, kind of a random uniform scatter of dots. So I used R to plot a random uniform distribution, and I was thinking it would be good to have there's some parts of the graphical abstract where I'd like that to be those to be black and then other parts where I'd like it to fade into the background. So I'd like to make it um, like more gray or something like that. So I was thinking if we wanted, if I was gonna do the if else I might do something like uh, if if I asked for, um, you know, background background dots, uh, make it the, make the color gray in the plot versus if I wanted foreground dots and then I could have one function to give me, um, my two different options of that. So maybe that's something we can try. Also would be a different option instead of changing the color maybe? Yes, I, yes, I, I yeah. <laughs> I agree. Thank you. It just depends on, I don't know what the figure looks like. It might be better to just make it. I don't know what it looks like yet, so we'll see. Yeah, I kind of want to try it. That's, I think that's the nice thing about, you know, if you're trying a bunch of things over and over again, then making a function makes that process less annoying sometimes. Yeah. Are you uh, using patchwork or something to make your graphical abstract? Or I don't know if you need multiple figures, but uh for this i'm it's pretty much all being done in bio render which is like a i don't know if you've used that it's like a uh, drawing program for biological stuff so they have a like, million icons of like cells and body part take about a minute to finish up does anyone else have more questions Stephanie, can you show me where you, you started and you said you set your working directory and your source but i didn't see that can you show oh that? Yeah, so there are a couple of different ways that you can do it. Um, in the terminal, you can just do, um, so get wd tells you where you are, what your current working directory is. Um, set wd allows you to change it. So I can set it back, for example, to my desktop um, just by going set wd. Um, and then if we do get wd, you can see now it's at my desktop. Um, you can also do this um, here in the windows. So say I go uh, right now, my little file window is showing that I'm in this um, in the directory for this thing. And we can click these three dots. Um, oops, sorry. If, sorry, if you click more, then you can just set set this as your working directory um, from our studio instead of from the from the command line. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there are two different ways to do it. Either with the, the set WD. I didn't see. Pardon? Oh, yeah. So source, source 
yeah, you'll just call source and then um, you, I'm already in here, so we should just be able to do all the possible dogs come up because I typed in the P and now the source is possible dog okay. one. And when I list, you can see that the functions inside possible dog one um, are showing up in my environment. If okay. you don't specify source, will you still be able to use that function? So the way that you can use the function without specifying source is by actually like physically copy pasting it into your, um, into your uh, console. So if I do that, um, then um, it also will know that dog check is something that we're, we're looking for. So if I just wrote a function um, really quick, so say I did my function, oh, sorry, well, whatever. If you write your own function, yeah. um, you don't have to have it live in a file. You can just put it in your environment and um, copy paste it in and, and it'll, this it'll be there. Thanks, so one second. So source actually is if you want to kind of run the whole file, but if you want to specifically run certain parts of the file, you can always select that up. And if you just uh, hit on command enter, it's going to run as many lines as they are selected. So you don't even, as a shortcut, you don't even have to copy paste. If you're right. in your code, you just say command enter, yeah. it's going to run the entire chunk. Yeah, but do you have to specify a source that's in your working directory or it can be anywhere? It just has to be. It could be anywhere. And you can only specify one source per code. I'm not clear on that. Any okay. number. Any number. You can okay. source as many files as you want. If you have many function scripts spread across multiple files, you can source them all at the start. So all the functions are readily available for you. And then okay. you can call the functions within your new script. Thank you. And then Janani, if we had a question at the beginning. So you know when you have a function we got to come back. You know, when you have a function uh, like where you have summarize that lives in dplyr and summarize mm -hmm. that lives somewhere else and you can yep. do the double colons to specify. Yep. Yep. If you have um, two source files and you have uh, two different functions with the same name and different source files, which would be bad practice, um, yep. but can you specify them um, with the source file name? Yes, or... and you can also use the conflicted package. So in your, uh, wherever you're using these functions, you, when you're defining them, you can mention their upfront using the conflicted package. If the same uh, function is appearing in multiple places, then prefer this over the other one. So you can explicitly mention that. So whenever you're calling the function, you don't even have to use the double colon. It'll automatically take priority because you've mentioned it upfront. So that's also right. a clean practice to have. But otherwise, yeah. what Stephanie says is perfect. Just use the double colon so you're very clear about which function you're calling because there's always this, this disambiguation issue. Yeah, and if you're writing your own functions, obviously you want to name functions that are doing different things by different names, if at all possible, <laughs> uh, just to make things less confusing. But obviously if you're using a package, you don't have control over that. So, all right, we should probably go back. Back to main session. For breakout, let me know if you think it needed to be longer, if you think it needed to be shorter, that kind of thing. But uh, let's see here. Looks like pretty good group. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and move on to some other fun stuff. So this already actually came up a little bit in some of the conversations that folks were having in the breakouts that I popped in and, and um, chatted with. Um, and this is the idea of data types, which we need to really understand before we can get too deep into discussions of how functions work. So the types are just literally sort of the species, as it will, of the objects that you're interacting with when you're working in R. This is not specific to functions, but it's helpful to think about when you're thinking about what ingestion your function is going to have and what's going to come out of it. So we have the type that's logical or Boolean. This is what the return was on the beginner function is either true or false, but an object, you know, you, you assign true to letter A, then now that A object is a Boolean type object. Integers are obviously numeric without any decimal places. And so you could have the, that type is if you assign the number 500 to A, A becomes numeric and an integer. 
Um, double or flute are with decimal places. These are also under the overarching category of numeric. In R, there's sort of a, uh, a taxonomy of types. So numeric includes doubles or floats in integers. Of course, there's strings, characters. Anything in quotation marks will be considered a string. And then you can have what's called a closure, which is really just a function or some other kind of, of object that is in that, that ballpark. So if you assign the function sum with parentheses, the whole works to A, A is now a closure object. Um, and A will have the characteristics and the properties of the thing that you just assigned it. Um, you can learn a lot more about types. There's a ton to learn. There are a lot of other types as well. This is not even getting into things like data frames and arrays and lists and so on and so forth. But um, you can use question mark type or question mark mode at your R command line, and you can learn lots more about the types that are available and what their characteristics are, because all of these will have different characteristics and properties as you interact with them. <clears throat> So then we're going to talk about the arguments. We're talking about what your function accepts and what it does not accept. So uh, we looked at this in the last one where you were passing in, in the beginner example, you were passing in a numeric, a numeric uh, variable. Um, and the argument was just a number and that's all it needed to be. But if you uh, are passing more than one argument, several of the advanced folks had examples where they were already creating functions that are going to accept more than one argument. You need to make sure that you keep track of what they're called. They have to have names in the function itself. They don't have to have defaults assigned. You'll remember if we go way back here, A and B don't have defaults assigned. You can see up here, they're just function A comma B. And if you don't assign them a value, they won't have one and your function will go, ah, ah, what do I do? If you assign an, a default though, that it can be a great thing and it can be dangerous. Because if you forget to assign a value to A or B, it will say, well, you must have wanted it to be one. And it will be one and it will carry on just like that. So setting defaults can be really convenient if you don't want your user or the person who's going to use this function in the future to have to think about that. Say there's you know a value that is always a constant and they're never going to want to change it, but you still want to have it as an argument for reasons setting a default and then just saying you can ignore that you can leave it alone unless it's like a really special weird case that can be really helpful so if we run this function the way it's written right now a and b come in order one you know a first and then b if you were to take it my function and call it as two comma four two comes two gets assigned to a because they're both first if you switch them four comma two a gets assigned to four because now they're both first. The function and the inner workings of the function, they understand this order and it matters. So you can't just shuffle them around any which way unless you've named them. In which case I could write my function b equals four comma a equals two and we're good. So the names you assign carry the precedent, but the order comes next if you don't give it a precedent. So <clears throat> you might have already guessed, we're going right back to the breakout rooms. We are going to talk about, okay, the beginner example. I've changed some things in the example function, and I want you to try running it and talk about what those arguments are now. Think about the types and and decide what um, would happen if you gave it an object or gave it an argument that was not the type it was expecting. So try it. Try giving it, say, a, you know, a Boolean or a string or something when it's expecting a number or whatever. And then for the advanced groups, add or if you haven't already add arguments to your functions and then make sure that you are understanding how that will change the output if you've already got one argument maybe add another one try to add some complexity and sort of see how they're all going to interact so everybody take off and i've put the five minutes up but as we saw in the last time i'll br i'll jump around and if we need more time we'll take it so off you go Yeah, and if anybody is having trouble getting our studio to work or need help installing um, the test app package, can you stay in the main room and we could just talk about it in the main room? 
Um, can somebody assign me to, I believe I was in the advanced one. Advanced one, yeah. yeah. I probably can't. Oh, advanced one is not actually showing up because you're already in it. It shows. Oh. I think if you just click, can you click join? Oh, I can. Yeah, I can see. Sorry. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you. Hi, I just had a quick question. Um, are we supposed to be pasting the code in, or is are we supposed to be downloading like the file into the R Studio? Either will work. It's entirely up to you. Yeah, um, you I couldn't the... figure out how to like download it in. Um, so have you gone to the GitHub page and looked at it there? Have you ever cloned a GitHub repository before? No. Okay. So I'll just get on screen and do one for you so you can see. So I'm going to use my RStudio. Let me pull it up here because I left and have it open. But let me share my our studio page give you just a second here uh, stephanie could you share the link again for folks who are just joining um, yes. to the github repo yep um let me put it in the chat and those of you who are new we are right now in the middle of an exercise so it, based on whether you're a beginner or an, or an advanced please pick the appropriate breakout room and if you can't join it just send a message and we'll put you there oh sorry to All interrupt right. please go on stay so my font size is teeny tiny right now. Let me bring that up. Okay, so here I am in my console right here. I'm gonna click the terminal tab. And so now I'm gonna go up to my repos folder. I have a repos folder in mine. And if you hit, if I hit. Wants to, to kind of jump in and sort of move over, then please let me know. Um, so can everyone see my screen? A little tiny. Yeah, maybe zoom in a little okay, bit. Okay, let's see if I can zoom in. So what I'll try to do is kind of walk you guys through what this is and maybe what I think it's doing. Um, and if it makes sense, then we can talk about it. And if there's parts that don't make sense, and if this doesn't work, just maybe we'll just say, okay, this isn't working. So what it's trying to do here is <clears throat> with the epigenetic data, we also have, um, when we're looking for batch effects, sometimes we're trying to find out if the chip or the array or the, the batch that was run are correlated with the principal components of the, the data, because it's, you know, 800,000 data points. So we have to sort of take those principal components rather than looking at any one individual value. And what this does is it produces um, a heat screen plot, which on the top, which would be much easier if I could show it to you, but um, it sort of shows sort of a screen plot for principal components, uh, which looks a little bit like a stair step thing. And on the bottom, oh man, I need to show you guys this because uh, it's so much easier. I'm, well, I, then I'm going to be all looking around for an image of it, but, and then on the bottom, Hello, Janani. All good. All good so far. Okay. Just popping in. You adding any functions of your own? <laughs> I would like to, but no. So they're all it. yours. Some they're all yours. <laughs> are uh, uh, within the if conditions uh, we won't get an error if uh, if there's a deviation from any of the if conditions i mean if the condition is not specified then we'll get an error that's the gist of this exercise right so it's yeah so it's like if the condition is not met so for example if um we had this was false uh, or for some reason, if basically the condition is false or if it's not met, then you would get an error or you would get like the doc check doesn't work. But like if 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 the question you're asking is like if the function, 
the function won't work if it's like if you don't have the brackets or you have certain like syntax errors. So it's like um, this this function will let's see return possible doc which is a boolean it will return um, true if it has fur and it's less than 112 centimeters and greater than nine centimeters. So that's basically what this function is saying. Right. So basically, if uh, the height is greater than 112 and has fur is true, it will. If has fur uh, equals, and then I would put C, and then um, you said like a value from one to 10. Okay. Right. So like if fur is this value from one to 10. So that would work for any value between one to ten, or would it have to be then in that case the vector itself that it has? No, to it would work for any value one to ten. Okay. okay. Um, I think. <laughs> so uh, let's try uh, this. So now maybe we have... it would have to be one equal in that case, right? What's the difference between two equals and? Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I, I'm just wondering. Um, so two equals actually it should be two, two equals. equals. Okay. Two equals is sort of if you're looking for like a true false, like okay. is um has for equal to uh this thing one equals um is the same as using an arrow you're like setting um you're setting a value so in that case you would be setting has for as an object to the the vector um one through ten which is not what we want so if you're asking is this a true false question is has for uh a value between one and 10, you want double equals. Okay. Um, if you're trying to specify an object called has fur as the vector one through 10, then you'd either do one equals or you do the arrow. Mm -hmm. um, the arrow is um, R sort of syntax, but either works. So now um, say here we've changed our function and we do has fur two. Yeah. The condition has length of greater. Yeah, so it would have to be equal oh, to yeah. that vector, right? That's the problem. Yeah. We would do if has fur is in. Oh, okay. Sorry. C1 through 10. Okay. And that pipe, when do we use the pipe there? So this isn't a pipe, actually. Okay. Um, the pipe um, looks like this. Okay. Looks like this. Um, and um, I've only really used the pipe when I'm working in the in the tidyverse, and that passes um, sort of the output of one function straight to the input um, of your of your next function. In isn't a isn't a pipe. It's just saying um, like does our has for value live um, in this vector. So let's try that. Try it again. So now we're good. Cool. Okay, thanks. For, for true. Yeah. I Any have, other question? Oh yeah, I go have ahead. like a really basic question. This is the first time I've ever seen R before. Um, oh my god, does okay. Capitalization matter. So I noticed when I typed in true without it being capital, it like it didn't like that. Right. So capitalization does matter. Um if so there's two different sort of ways that you can, a few different ways that you can use the word true. Um, so if you're, see how, um, so our sort of colors um, different, our studio sort of colors different things in different ways, depending on what type of um, object the word is. You can see that like my functions here in white, some things are in white, else is yellow, if is yellow. And you can see that, um, these true and false values are um, the same color as the numbers. Uh, that's because here the true and false values are their own sort of object class um, called a, a Boolean. Um, and uh, so basically it's its own thing. Whereas, um, so if I did, um, let's say dog uh, equals uh, true, and we'd say class dog. Uh, that's a character because it's just text that I put in quotation marks. So R is reading this as just a piece of text, right? Uh, but if we did dog is true, sorry, uh, with 
about it, then it should say that it's logical, which means uh, that it's a Boolean value that it's reading. It's either a true or false and not as a piece of text, the word true. Um, I know that's a, a little confusing and it's sort of hard to um, wrap your head around. And then if you don't put it in quotations, um, so for example, if you just had this, um, I could type and spell, that would be better. Um, if you just try to do lowercase true, uh, anything that's um, basically not in quotations that you're just typing in, um, R thinks is an object that you're trying to specify. Um, so it likes dog here because I've made dog an object. It's going to come up true. R knows what dog is, but R doesn't know what the word, just the random word, lowercase true is. Does that make sense? I know that's yeah, I think it's so. automatically changing it. Yeah, so basically unquoted, capitalized, true and false are like their own sort of thing that almost act like like numbers. Um, but and R know, is a bit forgiving a there. It even accepts just T or F. As long as it's yeah. capital, it's good with it. Yeah, You're right. But That's lowercase, good. it's going to think it's an object. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. That's okay. I wanted to ask a beginner question before we get dashed out. It's about terminology. So is the argument in this case is... Um, has fur is an argument and true is the value of that argument? Is that the right terminology? That's what I would, that's what I would say. Okay. Uh, and say, I'm definitely beginner too. So thank you. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, yeah. So the value of the argument has fur would be true. Okay. Um, and, or, you In know, this whatever. case, actually, I think has fur is just a variable. When you say argument, oh, okay. usually you're assigning some value to it. Here you're just checking if that variable is taking a particular value. So it's just a variable and a value pair. Whereas when you have a function, for instance, the height CM and has for, oh yeah, actually, sorry. Yeah, that's has what she was referring argument. to. Right, right, yeah, right. Has so for has for there is the argument. But in the if condition, when you're checking, it just acts as a variable. But in this right. case, it's also an argument, yes. Thanks for clarifying, Janani. Yeah. Okay, should we head back? Is it about that time? So it seems like a few people are having issues and heading back. So maybe in about a minute, I'll close all the breakout rooms just to be sure we have everyone. Yeah, I, even I'm having issues. I was okay, issues then I'll bring back. you all back. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> And so this is um, Stephanie's uh, GitHub repo for uh, functions R. And then I'm going to click code and then I'm going right. to click download zip. Oh, I see. And then it'll, 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 and then you just save it and then go into that directory to use it. Yeah, like um, unzip the file and then go into the directory. And yeah, and then in order for you to use like um, git, git commands to link to GitHub and stuff, on your Windows, you should download um, Git, um, and then you will be able to use all those commands. But uh, that might take a while. So. Okay, that's interesting. Like I said, because I'm used to using like the SSH clients to get into the HPCC, so you don't have to download an extra Git command in order to to use the Gits. So I didn't realize. happens to me all the time too. I had to I had to install wget on my personal computer the other day because I'm just so used to it being like it just lives in the HPC. <laughs> okay so I think we're going to return to main meeting here and it sounds like there's been some moving back and forth between breakout rooms and main challenges so um Janani was going to close the, the breakouts and then recreate them. Okay, sounds good. We'll figure it out. In the meantime, you can look at coordinates. <clears throat> They're very cute puppies. More fun to look at than code. <clears throat>
Okay, so now I think we are ready to move along. So the next thing, as you might have guessed, is going to be talking a little bit about what returns from your function. Um, when you're looking into a function, like you, you, the the return is the you know perhaps mutated or adjusted or you know altered in some way, you know, version of whatever you've passed in, or it is a response to something you've passed in. As is sort of the case with the beginner examples that you guys have been looking at. Um, R does not support multi returns, which if you're coming from another programming language, particularly from Python, that may be a, you know, something to get your head around. You cannot return two different things at the same time from an R function. You can return a list from an R function, you can return a whole data frame, you can return the biggest single object that you can think of, but you cannot return multiple things, which is important. Um, the return can be any type. It can be anything that you have returned, you passed into a function. Any of those types is perfectly acceptable to have as a return as well. Um, a function can change the state of an existing object without using a return. That is part of the concept around global environments, which we'll get to in a little bit. But just so you're aware, you may run into functions where it doesn't return anything, but it does make some sort of change to the low, you know, the environment in which you're operating that is more silent and that's a thing that you will definitely encounter from time to time um there are a lot of things to keep in mind around the way that you design your returns uh, you want the return to be generally the same type every time no matter what the argument has been so if you're returning true sometimes the other times it should return false or you know maybe na you don't want it to return true sometimes and seven other times because someone using this function might be chaining it together with other functions and then they might need the types to be consistent setting it up so that the return is something reasonably explicable comprehensible and predictable is really the the trick it says for the next user who's going to use this code who may very well be you probably will be you it might be you a little bit along in the future and you have forgotten why you wrote this or how you wrote this or all of that so making sure that you think about that future use when you have perhaps forgotten some of the things that you know right now is really helpful. Um, and we're going to jump right back in to another practice because I've got this next one that's about returns and it's going to let you for the beginners look at now what's been changed in the in the example it's going to have changes to the return so see what that is look at how that's inter how that will be interpreted for the end user. Um, mess with it change it fiddle around with it on your own computer and see what happens. And for the advanced, I want you to try adding in a return to your function that is two elements in a list. Give it a shot. See if you can figure a way to make it return two things. The beginner example that I've given now will, so that's one that you can model it off of. Um, and we will come back in a few minutes. Do we, I think, do we need to recreate the rooms now? Oops, I have accidentally moved us, sorry. I think Janani can have I just that. opened okay. all the rooms again, so people should be come back. Well, that's easy. I'm nice. I'll go. I'll go browse around the rooms now and see what people are up to. Manel and Vinny, uh, any preference between which uh, breakout room you want to join, beginner or advanced? Oh, hey, I, I don't. I think like I was automatically assigned to this room. <laughs> oh, okay, I can put you in breakout room. Oh no, I, I don't. I don't care. Any room is fine. Yeah, um, Vinny, she's a co-organizer for our lady I, Chicago. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, Ola. I'm I'm sorry. I I I'm sorry. I actually didn't really participate in organizing this event, but it's a fantastic event, I have to say. No, I've always okay. wanted to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good job. So, what are we supposed to do again? <laughs> um, uh, right now I'm just chilling, but <laughs> um, if you, um, um, part two. I don't have. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, Manu. I'm oh, sorry, I don't. 
I don't have a but... preference for a room. Uh, actually, I don't know which uh, one I should choose. I'm just looking to the to the uh, script right now, and I, I I joined the meeting very late, so I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh no problem, no problem. So no those problem. of you who joined late, just feel free to join one of the beginner rooms, and uh, the TAs there should be able to help you. Okay, you can okay. just click on the breakout room uh, icon in your Zoom, and then just join either beginner one or beginner two, and let us know if you have any issues. Uh, okay, could you help me to find the yes. icon for the room, please? You, you yes, just need to click on breakout rooms icon. There should the be four squares. Screen. Ah, okay. Yes. Are we working on like dog part two project? Is that the way it is? I think we're working on part three now. Oh, part two. Oh, sorry. You guys are ahead of me. Or I think we're working on part three. Gotcha. Sorry, I was just like in the middle of a work day, so I have to multitask. <laughs> And also, uh, I cannot understand the quotations in the first, in the problems, yeah. Sorry. Okay, yeah, so um, it's basically, so this paste zero is like the part that's helping us um, format um, our list. So when we look at this list, dog parameters and possibly a dog, um, this dog parameters is just basically like the label of the first part of our list. So the reason it's in quotation marks is because it's a string. Like if we didn't have the quotation marks, it object params that used the information from um, height and has fur, and we used it with this paste function. And what you get is uh, just a character string. So a piece of text where we have, it tells us that fur equals true and height in centimeters is what we set as our height in centimeters. So basically it's pasting um, whatever um, height in centimeters equals and whatever has fur equals into a character string. Does that make sense? So that's what the paste function does. And um, so now um, the return of our function is going to give us um, a list that contains um, the parameters as well as um, whether we have a possible dog or not. So let's set source to one. Possible dog three. And we'll do dog check. Uh, we can put in the same, like similar parameters as before, where we have um, height is 50 and fur is true. So now instead of giving us one output, we have two outputs, or it technically is one output, an object called a list, but that list has two um, things inside of it. And one is um, dog parameters, which gives us our pasted output param, and then the answer to the function, whether this is a dog or not true. And then um, let's say instead of just you know printing out um, the output of dog check that we um, make the output itself an object. So I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to call it dog equals the output of this function dog check with the parameters 50 and true. And so now it's not going to print anything out, but it's saving the output of the function in an object called dog. And so if we ask um, what type of object dog is using the class function, then it's going to tell us that dog is a list. And we can look at, uh, we can see how many items there are in this, um, in this list um, using the length function. So if I do length dog, it's going to tell me that there are two objects in the list. We can see that here. One is dog parameters, one is possibly dog. And it can even tell us the names. So if we do names dog, it's going to tell us that these two 
objects within the list are called dog parameters and possibly a dog. Then uh, if I want to know what the dog parameters are, I can type in dog and then um, say the name. Give me here. Uh, dog parameters in quotes, and it'll give me just the dog parameters that we put in. Fur is true, and height is 50 centimeters. Um, I can also do dog. And it'll tell me that possibly a dog is true. So this is sort of um, a way to get around um, our only wanting to, only outputting one object per function because technically the list itself is the object that we're outputting and that's only one thing um, but the list contains two pieces of information of dog parameters and possibly a dog um, that uh, that we can access um, is there an advantage to outputting a list rather than a data frame or a matrix in this case for example so um i think if you're only out, if, if you had, uh, it doesn't really make sense to um, make a, a data frame, for example, that only has like two rows in it. If you were planning on outputting, you know, a bunch of different dog parameters and a bunch of different results. Jamie, we, we keep getting new people, but new joiners and, and, and leavers, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh... You have to create a list of objects. So it's kind of like a cheating R. <laughs> you can, exactly, yeah. if you remove the list, you won't be able to get back to information. You can, you can just only do one. But if you build a list with the return stuff, then you can just return many, many objects. So list function, it just creates a list of things while the params was created uh, earlier using the function paste, we just combine strings with the arguments. And there's paste with zero and there's paste without zero, but if you use paste without zero, you have to define uh, how strings are connected with, um, with arguments. So then you would have to define at the end if you just connect them with space or, or whatever you want. So you can just read somewhere about the different between different paste functions, but here are just two different functions to get a final result. Yeah. Right, right. If I if I used a paste zero instead of list, or everything uh, came in one line basically, even the last true, even the uh, last return also was. Uh, in a sense, appended to the particular uh, string. Yeah, list just helps you separate. So it's not just a string, you're returning different parts of the list. So like later on, if you want to access the different parts of the list, um, you couldn't really do that with paste because it's just printing what you have. But the list will like let you say, oh, I want to get this part. I want to get dog parameters of the list. So if you want to access that later, you could which is why we would want to use list. Another reason. Um, can I just ask you why did you um, paste again uh, else possible dog uh, false? Yeah, so the reason we did that was um, when we put the f um, numbers outside of this, um, the height, and, like if it was greater than 112 and less than nine, um, we were getting an error, the error um, object possible dog not found. So by putting the extra nested elf, um, it should have worked to get um, any condition like to say um, that 
it's a dog or it's not a dog. Okay, and so by uh, putting it twice, it would um, more easily. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we have this this if and we have this else. So um, we want to have two different else statements. Should we close the breakouts for the to get people moving back? Okay. Yeah. There we go. Boom. Being evicted. Uh, so powerful. As we talk about docs, we'll go back to breakouts though. So. All right, looks like we're almost all back, so I will carry on. So the next thing that we're going to talk a little bit about is documentation. And you, if you've been using R for a while, you may already have be at least familiar with using documentation because a lot of the packages and libraries that you're familiar with, you know, your D pliers and your, your stringers and your this and that will have quite robust documentation already built in. But that's package documentation. That's like the big, you know, stuff. But every function can have documentation. And if you plan to share a function with other people or, you know, if you hope to remember later on what this function is all about, you will find it very valuable to add documentation to your functions. So inside the script, when you're writing a function, you've got, we've already talked about, you've got your little wrapper and it says function and parentheses and your arguments and curly braces and the whole business is sorted out. On top of that, above that, before that section of code is where you'll put something like what's on the screen right now. This is all going to, have, every line starts with, you know, hash mark, single quote, space, and then things. Um, and you can use the Roxygen package to sort of automatically generate some of this for you, but it's not necessary. You don't have to go getting an extra package for you and just write hash a, a, a single quote, space, yourself. And there's a few different things that you'll put into a documentation like this. You'll want to make sure that the first line is a short explanation of what your function does. This is not a paragraph. This is not the time to write the great American novel. This should be short, but it should be clear so that someone looking at it can get a general idea of what's this function for without having to read everything in detail. If you can't explain the function in one line like that, you might have too many things stuffed into your single function. It might be time to break it up into multiple functions. There's no shame in that. There's nothing wrong with that. But this is a good test to see, is this function trying to do everything for everybody? Or is it super, super specific such that I need to caveat, caveat, caveat? Those might be signs that your function needs to be right-sized and to use corporate speak. Next, you'll have a few lines. Usually, this is all this is all sort of custom, but not rules, I should say. The way that this is organized, the order in which these things are laid out. You could put your return line up first, your examples in the middle, and your params at the bottom. You, you can do all kinds of stuff. But param at param indicates that this is going to be the line that indicate that explains the role of one of the arguments. A param in this case is one of the arguments. So for us, it's a and then you'll give, this is also custom, not, not like law, type. Give it the type of the, of the object it is going to be. Is it integer? Is it going to be a float? Is it going to be a Boolean? I like to list that right up front, make sure everybody knows what they should be expecting and what I'm expecting of them as you know, the function owner. And then a short description of what this is supposed to be. So in the case of 
the example that you're looking at, if you're in the you working in the beginner group, it's going to say that we know what height in centimeters is supposed to be. It's not height in centimeters of this building. It's of this animal we're trying to investigate, right? Similar, just keep listing for all of the arguments that you have. And then your return is makes sense too, right? It's a line. It says at return comes first. And then it doesn't need to have a name because remember, functions have one return in R. So you just give the type of the, often it's a list for me, you know, because I'm trying to give more than one thing out. But it can be, you can go into more detail about the components of the list. Then description of what this is supposed to represent, what it should be expecting, what it's going to be useful for, and that kind of thing. And then at the end, you can have the examples section, optional section, don't have to do it, but you can put in this is how I would use the function. This is an example of how I have run this function so that if someone has read the other stuff they're, and they're not quite clear what you really mean, looking at an example as you've been doing over the course of the breakouts today is really helpful. It can really make it click. And so I try always to use an example when I have the chance. So you're explaining what the arguments are, what the returns will be, what it's meant to be used for, and you can add other stuff too. You can add a description that's a longer discussion of what it's all about, so you don't have to have your great American novel in that first line. You can you can give more detail if you feel like it. Why it was created, the reasoning for it, any caveats or limitations, stuff like that. You can include those things too. But there are some notes at the very end of the presentation today that are also on the GitHub page that are we'll talk in more detail about documentation because this can get to be a whole bag of of um, you know worms. Um, Janani, raise, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so I just raised my hand to bring to attention that there are a few questions in the comments box. So I just wanted to ask them to you, yeah. Stephanie. Uh, so one please. of them is the distinction between a regular comment and the kind of comment that's written for our, our, our oxygen too, sorry. And mm -hmm. uh, how it knows to understand these um, different parameters that you're calling. And the other question was the difference between arguments and parameters. And there was finally one more about okay, why so the I'll, don't run is used for the example. Yeah, I can see this. Um, okay, so um, the the hash mark plus the the um, apostrophe or your single quote is a specific formatting for just the documentation of functions or classes in packages, okay? So you can use a hash mark for a normal comment, comments anywhere, but when you do hash mark single parens, that's when it's going to is you build if you build a package out of this it's going to create package documentation for your functions because it knows that this is what that's supposed to mean how does it know that i cannot tell you i am not a developer when it comes to sort of package package ecosystems in in the same way mail can probably tell you next month but the there's this is the syntax for identifying the structured documentation for a function separate from comments about who's it's and what's it's anywhere else. Um, and that's why it has to come on the same page before the function that you've actually written and the code needs to be like in, in order that way. If you have multiple functions in a single file, which you can totally do, and you can do that in packages as well, it has to go docs, function, docs, function. They have to come together in the same page in order. Um, I hope that explains that. Um, but this is, yeah, this is the, the Roxygen 2 formatting. Um, and da, 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 da. I can find some links about this and share them as well during the next breakout. Uh, argument same as perimeter. Yes, for this, in this case, it's the, 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 the framing for it in the docs, the way that it's written like this, it's at param. It just means arguments. So don't, don't worry about that being different. Oops. Um, the example says don't run and this okay this is kind of bad practice this is probably not i shouldn't i should probably have just left it when you're building a package you can have examples when you run the the documenting of of a whole package and you build all of the documentation for the package it will test your examples to make sure that they run and are not broken as a part of the overall package testing process so if you don't put wrap it up like this It'll run it, and if it breaks, it will say, Meh, problem. 
Um, so this is sort of like a way to say, don't, don't bother. And even if it would run, but it would take forever and it would make the whole package build process take forever, you can wrap it up like this too. Technically, you should leave it out unless there's a good reason to not run it. Um, I, because you want to know if your tests are broken, if your if your code's broken in your examples, because a bad example that doesn't work is going to really cause people problems because they'd be like, I used the example, why didn't it work? And it's a good good point. Um, but sometimes you get lazy and you don't want to wait. So that's what I've done. Uh, sounds like this formatting, so the next step is your function. Yes, that is, that is, I think, an accurate statement. So formatting the, the documentation like this is what's going to allow this function to smoothly come into the package that you're going to build someday. Um, it means that the documentation, if you go into, say, the help section on our studio, I can actually get an example up and you can just look at it real quick. Come on, our studio, come back. Too many things open at once. Um, let's see. I'll show you an example of some docs and then you can see what I mean. So, share a different screen for a moment. All right. So, here I'm looking at, I'm in my R Studio window. And I'm looking at D player's count function in the help. So I've been run question mark, D player, colon, colon, add underscore count. And that's just what came up first. I just, you know, just picked something random. So when you look at this, it's got count observations by group. That's the first line of that documentation for that function we were just writing. Then description. As I said, with these functions, description's optional, whatever. Usage is another thing that you'll add in a package context, less so in just the unique one-off functions. And then we've got arguments, params, and it says X, and here's what it means, and wait, and here's what it means, and so on. Value is the same as the return. Value is the is what it's going to give you back. So an object of the same type as data count and add count, blah, 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 blah. And then examples. As you can see here, we've got examples, and all of these examples are un, you know, uncommented, unwrapped. They're going to run every time you build dplyr. And that's that's the gist. So this is what you get out of it if you use the code documentation process correctly, it will return you something like this when you build your package without you having to touch anything else. I hope that helps. How, how a function can be broken. Oh, okay. So if your function requires something that doesn't exist in the ecosystem or in the environment, that can break it. Uh, if you, syntax errors, forgot a comma, forgot a parenthesis, that'll break it. Um, yeah, things like that. If another dependent library is not available or something like that, or if it, you have a dependency that's required for the function to run, you don't, testing it in a vacuum may be a problem. That can break it. So lots of stuff. I've broken many functions in my time. Um, okay, so we are actually ready to move on to another breakout where you are going to write documentation. Hope everyone's excited. Um, it's back to the right page again. So many windows. Um, so now go ahead and open part four. This is, oh, sorry, I'm being uh, given things. So go ahead and, and open up part four for the beginners. There's documentation, a shell started, but there's big blanks in it. You're gonna have to fill in the blanks yourself. There's not a wrong answer or right answer. This is a part where this is you trying to interpret what this is and how you would explain it to someone else. So think about it that way. And then for advanced strokes, if you write documentation. It's a good practice. You should do it. And I will start the timer and I will come poke around with you all as you go. Okay. We figured the breakout groups thing. I think we got a movement now. Now let me go exploring. How are we all doing? Documentation making sense? 
Yes. Okay, good. I'm glad. If anyone has questions, let me know. I'll stick around for a minute or two and then move on to other groups. So Monica, uh, Sneha mentioned that you were helping her with this breakout room. She had to step out for class. Uh, she's an undergrad. And, um, would you uh, like to help us with this room? Yeah, otherwise, sure. <laughs> okay, otherwise Camille and I are here too. So just in case any of you have issues, please let us know. One of us will help you out. Okay. So I have, so the documentation do, does not make sense to me right now because if you are not creating a package, I don't understand how people can see your instructions. Well, they're going to be opening that file when they're looking at your code, right? If you're sharing a function with other people, you're sending them a file like this. So when they open that file, they'll see this stuff. Um, I wanted to introduce the idea of, of proper structured documentation like this, partly because you are going to have the workshop on functions coming up and this is a very important part of functions. So if you're writing for only yourself and you just want to use plain comment style without the extra sort of architecture, that's fine. You do what works for you. There's no, um, I think I was saying a lot of, not a law about this. It's, it's just, um, sort of setting you up for for understanding the next things that are coming along but if and it's just could, you gonna use it do uh, okay it. makes sense and can you re-explain uh why you use the space and the, the slash and the space not the slash but the typo we have to use and not just the yeah it's, hashtag it's hash mark single hash parentheses or is it, no no sorry not single quotation hash mark single quotation not a tick but a quote and then a space and then you write your stuff. Yeah, I didn't choose this syntax. It wasn't, it, it's not my favorite because so it's, it, a really, it's a convention for people. Yes, it's the convention for that, that is specifically known to the package building software that it will oh. read that and it will say, okay, this is documentation for the function that comes next. So doc string okay. and our oxygen to just likes this. If it sees it, it, it knows it has to throw it into the documentation of that function. Yeah. So it's just our queue. Yeah. Oh, okay. It automates the stuff so you don't have to write everything like twice and do all of that. It, once you get it moving and like get to building a package, it feels very magical. It's very cool. So. Yeah, that will be my next step on my on my walk. So I would be happy have, to join next month. Yeah. It's when perfect I, timing. <laughs> when I started building in packages, it was easy to write all the functions and do all the stuff and then to think, oh, documentation. But then you have to go back and write it for all of them, and it becomes a big just doing it on the you know as you build it just makes life easier too. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah, I think it's a good practice when you write something, just put a hashtag and give you some comments because I frequently get back to some work from a few months back. And then at the beginning I spent time wondering why the heck I did this that way. And if I had my comment saying, well, you put that number or something because you needed this, you know, that would save my time. So if you are entering that scripting word, just start remembering about putting the hashtag and just add a comment. It will really help you, you know, the follow the stuff going on. So that's, that's a good, good thing. <laughs> um, can I ask what a, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go, uh, go ahead, uh, Anna. I just Anna want to say the don't run stuff. So um, can I ask a question about the, the placement of the documentation? So uh, it's uh, the documentation, it's outside of the function. Um, so does it mean that it has to always be like back to back with the function? Uh, for the, uh, the uh, I don't know, the package builder or something to recognize it? Uh, yes, Be especially because you could have multiple uh, functions within the same file. So in fact, it's generally a good practice to throw this documentation into the function. In this case, yes, uh, it helps that uh, we start with doc check. Yes, you're able to see my screen, right? Okay, 
So here it's yes, mentioning that this screen. is the. If you can make the text a little bigger, that would oh, absolutely. Be Sorry, I'm sharing on a big screen, so I didn't know the difference. Is this better? That's perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so here basically they've mentioned that the documentation belongs to this function. So there's no ambiguity there. They're specifying what the different parameters are. And these will correspond exactly to what you're defining here as the arguments for the function. And then this is what you're going to return, which means here it's expecting a return function. And this, like she mentioned, is just an example. Don't run is not compulsory, especially if you know that it's going to work because there are packages called test that uh, that will actually test your functions before actually deploying the package. So this is meant for that. So, okay, what I was going to say is usually what I tend to do is to just throw it into the function. That way there is absolutely no ambiguity as to where it belongs and which function it belongs to. So every function starts with its documentation, just leave a line and then go on with the actual definition. And then here for your own sake, if you want to say the params has the concat concatenated text. Now, now all of this is just for you to understand the code better or someone else to understand. This has nothing to do with documentation. That being the main difference between adding this and not adding this. But before we run back to the main room, are there any other quick questions we can address here? Uh, Jalini, I, I do not quite understand what's the purpose of uh, having examples in the uh, documentation because in any case, it's not being run. Uh, okay, so there are... All right, I think we're mostly back. And so I'm gonna carry on and make sure that we get through everything that we wanna cover today. So uh, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is, and, and this is gonna be something that I think a lot of, especially new users to generally programming or to um, functions, you gotta get a little bit of sort of inner familiarity and comfort with errors. Errors are okay. And in this case, we are actively going to create a situation where errors may show up because we want to prevent our users from making mistakes that are easily preventable. What we're doing here is adding a type check. What this means is that we're adding the line, which you can see easily highlighted in yellow, where if someone passes in an argument that is of a type that won't work for this function, that it will say, hey, hold on a minute, you have made a mistake and it won't go through and keep doing the computation. It will stop right there, return an error, and the user will be explained in, you know, reasonably friendly and definitely very clear terms what the mistake was. So if you run this function that's on screen and you do the second line of, of calling it where I have, you know, commented it out because otherwise it will break my slide, um, and you run A equals true, it will say, wait, stop, A must be a number, because true is not a number. This is the kind of thing that you can add so that you will um, help future users, including future yourself, technically, um, to understand when they've made a mistake, what the problem is, and potentially you can instruct them on a possible easy solution. So I've just said A must be a number here, which indicates, you know, obviously you've given A the value that it can't be used here. And it's it's not the greatest of, of error messages that I've ever written or, or, you know, that kind of thing. And you can write anything you want in this error message so that it understand, so that you give the user a sense that they've got some guidance. They've got a little bit of, you know, help on their side to figure out how to use the function appropriately and how to get what they want. Checks, in this case, this is a type check. So I've got the if statement saying if it's a double, if it's not a double, because the exclamation point means not, right? If it's not a double, then say stop and say it must be a number. 
if uh, you wanted to check and say that A has to be greater than 10, you could do that. If you wanted to say that A must be a data frame, you could do that. You can do all kinds of things, right? So this is more, this is, this is using type as, a, as an example of the kinds of checks that you can create. Um, but it will create an error. It will say error, blah, 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 message that you have, have generated. And so you have to, I think, just get relaxed about the idea of errors. We're gonna talk about testing in a few minutes here, and we're gonna talk about testing for explicitly expected errors as well. So we're gonna get, get more into how errors can be helpful. This is sort of like how, you know, when you touch the hot stove, that discomfort that you're feeling is instructive and it will help you to do better next time. This is the kind of thing that we're talking about when we're talking about errors here. So what I'm gonna have you do in the next breakout, which is breakout five of six. So once we get this, we've got one more and then we'll have a little bit of chatter and then we'll, we'll finish up. We're going to open up this fifth uh, script. And for the beginners, I want you to look at a type check that I've already written into the function. Find a way to break this function. Try to get the error to appear. Run it yourself on your own code. And if you're in an advanced group, add a check to your functions arguments. I've said here a type check. It doesn't have to be a type check. It can be any kind of check you want. But add something so that when an argument is passed in that is inappropriate for your function, it will return an error and the user will get some sort of a response that makes sense. So let's go ahead and I think we can re-enable our breakouts. So there is one question in the chat oh, about there? what would happen if there's a missing argument and no defaults. Um, it will complain. It will break. It will say you, you haven't given me all the information that I need to run. Yeah, um, it, will, it will return an error that says you're missing an argument. Let's see, do we, do I just hit recreate on the rooms? Janani can help me here. Aha. Thank you so much. All right, I'll see you all again in five minutes or so. documentation of Postal Dog Part 5. We're actually going to um, see if we can break um, our new dog check um, function. So um, everyone should probably in their um, own R uh, run a version of dog check. Thanks, Janani, for sharing your screen. You've got the uh, set up so that your, your assignment operators look like real arrows. That looks so good. So the FIDA code so, ligature is really awesome with doing this. So I've mm -hmm. installed a specific font called FIDA code. Mm -hmm. And then it has these ligatures that makes it really awesome. So it awesome. joins together these comments and so awesome. all these things, it does really well. I like it. I should use yeah. that. Has, there, has anybody tried yet to break the code to make the type check fail? Yeah. I try by, um, I copy and I paste my my code in the chat. I put i centimeter is equal to a. Mm -hmm. and so you're, you're sending it a, but you're sending it a the object. And you, you might have already assigned a a value earlier. Put a oh, in the okay. marks and see what it does. Hmm. And if I put double quote a, mm -hmm. I also have. Okay, I'm, I would assign A to but Janani is doing a great job demonstrating that A must, height must be a number is uh, the error message that it's, mm -hmm. that it's turning, so. 
That's exactly what you should see. You can change okay. the message if you don't like that one, because I, you know, I just spit it out there, and you're welcome to to try other things and and to mess around with it and see what you can make happen. But that's something expected to have zero message plus a uh, bros parent bracket parentheses one. Um. That depends on your system. It's going to depend on oh. what kind of computer you're using. And then you have to click on stop the red square, right? Uh, again, that depends on your installation. Ah, okay. Yeah. I found that intimidating every time this happened. So basically, it's taking you to the part of the code and it's showing you why and where it's breaking. Where is the error message? So if you don't want that trace back, you'll have to exit that debugging state. And that's what your stop does. Oh, okay. So. Uh, like um, Stephanie mentioned, it's part of your settings. If you don't want it to bother you, you don't want the detailed debugging mode, you can mm -hmm. just let the error pop up and then just move on with the next function run. Got it. Thank I you. think that Janani found an error in my code. Oh no, because if he puts the true first, then um, it doesn't, if, if has fur is a failed, it doesn't go into the if statements at all because it's so obvious. here we could probably do that. We yeah, you can add another. Can accept that it's, another. it's logical. Mm -hmm. So here, if you add, it's logical now. For as for yeah. To say that function needs an update because if you put a value outside the range, then it will fail. It just needs another um, else for the possible doc false. We did this in that previous part. You should add it in there and then. Um, yeah, can you can make this better because I I clearly overlooked that that issue. No, no. So and I was just doing it to demonstrate it for them. Saying in one case you have the condition built it built in, in another case you right. don't. But this is the way you add it. So when you make mistakes and your function breaks, is when you know, oops, I have to add that condition. Otherwise, it may break for someone else. Mm -hmm. so just and they won't have any idea what the problem was, unlike where we say height is numerical. Now they'll know that mm -hmm. it needs to be illogical as well. So now if I stop this and run this again, it will take me exactly to that line. Although it's not been updated here, probably because I didn't save the function. So, But at least it takes me there. <laughs> and it says it must be logical. So this is actually a great tip that Stephanie pointed us to, which is function documentation and having helpful error messages is just as important as writing the function itself. Today, you're writing the function, so you know exactly what it's supposed to do. But when you come back in a month, you're going to scratch your head and wonder why the heck it's not running. Yes. So these error messages are going to be extremely helpful for you. And you probably mentioned that, but where should we write types? Um type check or any kind of check? Does it have to be after params uh, object? Um, Every so time that would be a nice... Um... I didn't explicitly write type check, but I added a type check. In this case, the line 18 already existed, which is checking whether or not the first argument is double. And then when we ran this line 31 with the character true instead of the logical true, it didn't mm. run, correct? It didn't give us the correct error message. And what is... if you put the type check, the, the line, what if you switch the line 19 with, uh, with 28, for example? What I mean is like the, the check has to be at the beginning or oh, it yeah. has to be just after params, like, like line 17? No, it, you, you want to put it at the bottom? We can put it at the bottom. And it will work. Well, I so think there is no convention. You want that to start when the check to happen. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you just want it, if you want to use it only to print the error message, then it doesn't probably matter where it is. But if as soon as okay. you enter the function is when you want to check, right, whether your arguments are correct or wrong. That's the reason it's sitting right on top. The first thing you check are my arguments the correct type of arguments. If it is not, you don't even want it to run anything because most likely it's going to be error prone, which is why you're starting there. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so generally for every uh, argument, we have this uh, error, uh, this type check. 
we can add it and that would be a nice thing to do because that way we are mandating that it has to be a particular kind of input so for instance if i'm expecting a file path they can't give me a number there which doesn't make sense right so we are just telling it has to be this so, just like that example in which has for was uh, yes. a string in okay. correct so i am saying that no it has to be logical you can't give me a string that doesn't mean anything for me because then my if condition can't make sense of a string like sneha was mentioning right so it has to be true or false without the quotes only then it's logical um, object well so, you can have that information without stopping the code so the code will break itself so instead of having stop needs to logical exactly just you know so if i don't have this logical right now let's say i'm just running the function and i'm just giving a character it will just say error but it will not tell me what the error is it's just telling me that possible dog is not found but but uh, suppose you had a number for has for then uh, it, it doesn't give an error let's say um, if you give you zero had, or uh, one yeah so uh, if you have uh, let's say you put um, has for as 5 uh, then it doesn't give an error that's because yeah, it's just checking point. that it's true So what this does is it it has a condition check, so right? We're about to end, Janani. So you maybe want to wrap up this because in forty okay. thirty seconds we're going to be in the main session. Okay. So basically, it's checking whether something is true or false. Usually, if there is an object, whatever the object is, it will consider it to be true, and that is why it is working. But if you have the is logical, then if you give a numerical thing, it will not work. Okay. So what I'm saying is, have this comment. and then if you have this number it gives you an error see it gives you an error because it has to be logical so that's the advantage of having this is your i'm saying without that it act all right welcome back everybody now i hope that um that all of that that stuff about checking in line uh made sense and that you can apply that to future cases i know that lots of folks that i was um talking to in the the beginner rooms were noticing that adding a test for the um boolean status of the second variable was a very important thing to do and that was um awesome that you guys all uh, found that and were working on it um the next thing that we're going to talk about though is adding external tests So we had a type check inside our function and that was very valuable it helps the uh, user in the moment when they're trying to use your function but then the test is an actual uh, extra like out, outside of your function tool that you can use to make sure that as you are developing your function as you're making changes as you're manipulating it as you build now and then want to change it later you won't break the desired core functionality that it's supposed to have or if someone else takes your function and makes changes they want to make sure that it still does what the you know it says on the tin this is where we're using the test that package so if you didn't install that when you were getting ready to to join today's um uh, workshop that's okay you don't need to worry too much about it but the test that package is what you will use to create tests that will make sure that the work that your function is doing is as expected so we're going to use some of the functions from that package here So a test if you're making packages later and you're doing that in next month's workshop writing tests is like table stakes you have to write tests for your functions because especially if functions need to work together or if they need to have consistent expectations and if you want to continue developing and building in new functionalities and changing stuff the tests will make sure you don't accidentally break the whole thing Here I've got a test that is going to that is titled function returns correct value very descriptive by now and we've got two steps in it first is product equals my function a equals to b equals 4 all that is is I'm running the function inside there so we got to get the product out so that we have a value to test then I say expect equal product 8 the number should be 8 product should end up being 8 if the function has done its job appropriately and that's what i'm testing right here 
if I run this second little chunk of code here and product is anything but eight, it will ble you know, yell at me and it will say, hey, no, you broke this. You expected it to be eight. Here's what it really was. And it will tell you those exact things, what it really is and what it should have been. And you can decide how you want to change it from there. The um, This is the sort of thing that that a lot of times people sort of don't get familiarity with tests until way later in the process of development, but you can write a test for any function at all. It doesn't have to be in the context of a whole big package and a whole system. I write, you know, functions for my own use for miscellaneous things, and I'll just have a file with the tests, and I'll just go run them manually from time to time. If you're building a package, this will all be run automatically as part of the building of the package itself. There's another thing now which is that you can set tests to in, to ensure that your errors come out the way that the errors should be. Because remember, we were just talking about how you want an error to happen and you want the error language to be instructive and clear when certain choices are made. So if the user enters a value that's wrong, you want it to return an error. You can have expect error like this, which just means an error should be there. Or you can give expect error and actually explain what text the error should contain so that you can make sure if I put in true and it says A should be Boolean, it would be like, well, that doesn't make any sense. I gave it a Boolean and it said it was wrong. So A should be a numeric is the appropriate error message that you want to see. So final practice, we're going to give it a few minutes and we're going to go write an actual test. For the beginners, I've given you a test where your uh, test will fail naturally. You can either change the argument to make the test pass or you can change the test. Those are choices. Most of the time when you're doing development, you won't want to change the test unless there's a good, very good reason, because likely is not you've changed your function in such a way that the test is your canary in the coal mine. For the advanced people, I want you to write a test for your function. It doesn't have to be fancy. There's lots of options. I put some, some notes in the actual script that you're going to be working from that'll give you some choices. You can expect an error. You can expect a value to be equal to another value. You can expect a value to be missing. You can expect all kinds of things. And so it gives you lots of flexibility depending on what kind of a function you're writing. But with that, let's go ahead and get our breakouts back for one more last go round. And I will see you all back here in about five minutes and we will wrap up the last few bits. So for this part six to run, you would need to have the test that package installed first. If not, that's where you begin. You can just say install dot packages and test that within quotes. And then this is just us loading the package. So first I'm just checking. Okay, there is a failure. So are you able to test this? So there should be a failure. And mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah. so less than thank you and and to fix it. I don't remember what the function does. So I'm just going back and checking with a function that doesn't fail. So the test that is failing because we have um, on line 35, Equal mm -hmm. fifty, 
and uh, line 37 we have 40. Yeah, that's why it fails. Well, because we mm -hmm. expected that the height will be 40, but we put the mm -hmm. argument of 50 then. Mm -hmm. So either you change the test results, which you usually don't want because it's your expectation. So you have to rather change your parameter. Yeah, so if you change it to 40 here, then it just says test passed. Does it matter for line 37 if you have height first and then fur? As in the function, we have height and then comma fur. It doesn't matter. No, the, it doesn't. the order of the parameters doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter. Why don't we try it? That's the best way to check anything. I may be wrong. Okay. There you go. Okay. It is expecting it in that order. I'm going to go back. So in your function, if you don't have a list with the dog parameters, mm -hmm. then you just need one, one line, one expect equal. Like you only, you will only need the line 36 if the line 28 does not include um, the params. Like. Yes. So here it is in this order and the, it is expecting both of, I mean, the dog parameters and possibly a dog. Okay. Th that's why we are running both of these checks could here. You, oh, makes sense. Could you re-explain, is it necessary to have a list for the return function line 28? So the reason there is a list here is basically because R by default only returns a single function, rather a single variable. So if you want it to return multiple variables, list is a way of collecting a few variables and saying, return this list. So in this case, I am interested in it returning both the parameter as well as this possible dog. I wanted to return two different things and that's why I'm throwing it into a list. This is our way of telling the R function. I'm interested in receiving two outputs for this given function for those parameters. Okay. So, so if, you don't don't use use this, sorry, if you don't use this, you will just, you will just say return parents if you're just re returning a single one all right welcome back everyone i um apologize if that was a short uh breakout i um just want to make sure that we get to all of the stuff that i've got on here but and be respectful of everyone's time because i'm sure you all have other things that you need to be doing in your friday afternoon um so next thing i'm going to talk a little bit about is environments um the concept that we talked about at the very beginning around how a function can def technically run without actually having a return, how it can edit something that is existent in the world around it, is based on the concept of environments. A function knows what exists inside of its own sort of walls. It knows what exists in the space in between its curly braces, and it also knows what exists in the global environment that's all around. Outside the function, the the world outside that function doesn't know what in, exists inside the, the function. So what we'll sh I'll show you here is how A, B, and C, these three objects that I'm creating inside my function, do not exist in the world outside of the function unless I make some specific steps. Here, we've got the function that we're familiar with. We've got A and B are the arguments that we're passing in, and then C is what's being created by the insides. But if I run print environment, and print objects outside my function, out in the world, no A, B, or C shows up. The environment is called the R global environment, makes sense. And the thing I have is this function, but I don't have the stuff that's inside it, and I don't have the arguments either, because the arguments don't get named until they go into the function. So where are they? If I run the function here and I put print environment and print objects inside the function, that's where they are. I've got a, b, and c, and I can return value of c and get that it's actually eight. So that's the trick that I'm getting 
when I inside the function, I can make stuff happen, I can move stuff around, I can make serve manipulations, but none of it's gonna go out into the rest of the environment and be independent of the function until I take the step of either returning it or doing what's called a global assignment, which is using the double arrow. If I use the double arrow to assign the value, here what you'll see is I print, you know, I run the same function, everything is the same, except now I'm calling it D, just so that we're clear, and I'm using the double arrow. And now when I run environment, I get A and B. The value is still eight, it returns eight still, that's no big deal. But then when I am now outside my environment, outside my function, because this is these two print statements right here, these two print statements here are the ones that are actually returning A, B, and eight. Here I'm outside. And now I've got D and my function on the outside. So that's the kind of thing that it's, a little dangerous. It's a little, you know, can get you in trouble if you say accidentally mutate something outside your function that you didn't mean to or that you're going to need again later. So be careful, but recognize that this is a thing that's possible and you can make these global assignments when the right situation calls for it. Um, if you do this kind of thing in your function, you should definitely make sure that you note it in the docs because that's going to make a big difference to the impact of this function on the user worth knowing, worth keeping in mind. You can mess around with these environments and you can think about what needs to go in what place as you're moving through. Don't make everything a globally assigned variable that's going to get crazy and you're going to be really confused about what exists and what doesn't. Some stuff just needs to exist during the function's life when the function is running. Some of it doesn't need to exist out there in the rest of the world and that's usually a sign that you should just leave it where it belongs. Hey Stephanie. Yes. I was just wondering, uh, is that a way you can sort of get around um, our functions only uh, returning one object? Yeah. I wouldn't use it that way. It's, it's tempting, right? It's tempting to say, well, I can just assign it globally and it'll just be there. But it, for a variety of reasons, it's kind of a bad practice. You assign something in your global environment then every time you run the function, it will change your global environment. And that could be a really, because you, in your global environment setting, you're, you're expecting things to continue to be there until you manually change them. It, yeah, it's, it's, I would recommend instead returning things in a list so that then you have the return that you can manipulate as needed. Once it's returned an item from a list, then you can assign it to an, something else and make it a standalone object and stuff like that can work. Um, yeah, I mean, technically, if you want to get into like the dark arts, <laughs> you could. I wouldn't, wouldn't recommend it though. Thanks. So another thing that I think is just worth like paying attention to is at, now that you're familiar with the concept of a function, how it works, what goes in, what comes out, what happens in the middle, the fun magic stuff, you can look at any function in R and see this exact same structure for anything. Go to your console. For example, for this, I picked the dplyr top end function, whatever. Run this code, just omitting the parentheses at the end of the function, and it will just print you the text of the function itself. And you can see what's inside it. If you want to write a function and you're like, well, I want it to sort of do something similar to what this other function does that I know about, just run something like this and it will pop right up. So you can do this yourselves, play around with it. Sometimes you'll come up with functions that are based on an under an, a, a, an architecture of like C++. And so when it is that, it will tell you it's like a primitive. Then that means it was never an R function at its core. So there's no R to show you. And that happens. You will definitely find that with stuff like if you try it on sum right now or something or multiply or something like that, it will say, yeah, no, that's like machine code. That's not the same thing. So you, you can keep that in mind too, but a lot of the very, you know, useful ubiquitous workhorse functions that you use every day, the code's not that crazy. It's not that complicated. You can open it up and see for yourself exactly what they're doing. And I recommend playing around with that because it's fun. Um, then one last thing, this might be obvious. This might be something that you can totally tell and you don't need me to explain, but just in case, you can use functions just like objects and combine them together to do lots of really powerful things. So in this case, I'm taking so, you know, using the sum function to create A, using the max function to create B. 
the max function is using the results of the sum function inside it, right? And then I can do that, the exact same result with the section, the second chunk in this slide. Uh, but it's a lot harder to read in the second section, right? If I assign it to a value first, or to an object first, and then use that object, I think it makes it much easier to read, easier to follow, unless like the line isn't even as long. There's just a lot of nice benefits to using functions, assigning objects, and then processing them together, chain them together. And this is really the foundations for like all of programming. Take functions, use them together, you know, chunk them in where they belong, and eventually you can create like pulse software packages and all that kind of stuff, right? This is that now your computers work basically. So uh, use this, consider this when you're working on stuff. Like I said earlier, if your function is too complicated to write in basically a sentence, what it does, break it up, make multiple functions, chain them together like this, and that will save you and your readership and your users a ton of pain. So only five minutes over time. That's not too bad. Basically, that's the stuff that I wanted to cover with you all today. Um, I you know, remember that the functions are just packages of code. They're little chunks of code wrapped up so that someone else can use them and someone else can understand them and that life can be really awesome when you get this working for your use cases. Um, accept input, return output, contains code in the middle. Doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. You can add the frills, add the docs, add the you know type checks and the tests and the stuff that we've talked about but really at the very very basic level it's just code wrapped up so that you can reuse it over again uh thank you all for being here thank you for being so engaged and so, so participatory in the workshop in the breakouts and all of that this has been really fun for me i would love to be you know to stick around for a while and talk more if people have questions or want to discuss any of the things that we've covered you can obviously find me online Twitter, my website, GitHub. Um, and I have some links. These are all on the GitHub page as well, so you don't need to like bother jotting them down or anything now. But these are, you know, documentation about the concept of functions in R specifically. And the last couples are about you know, documenting and and sort of the the making them usable for others bits that are going to be valuable. Um, yeah, and so I hope this has set you up really well for talking about packages and building your own in the future and then just for making your own code easier and more pleasant in the meantime. Uh, yeah, so that's it for me. Like I said, I'll stick around and answer questions if that's needed. But if you all have uh, places to be here, free to go. Thank you so much, Stephanie. A round of applause on everyone's behalf. Thank you. And thank you, Ola and Our Lady Chicago for bringing Stephanie to us. It's been amazing. There are a couple questions in raised hands, so. All right, I'm looking at the chat. Stephanie's if any... hand is raised. Yeah, go ahead, whoever's. Thank you. I'm another Stephanie, one of three Stephanies at least, I think we're here. <laughs> Um, so I'm, yeah, uh, and thank you, Stephanie Hickey, for being an outstanding instructor. That was really well done. Um, okay, so I'm beginner group. I'm looking at the part six R script. Mm -hmm. um, and when I put the code in R Studio and I want to run it, what I see is run tests. And I don't see it letting me run it immediately. And I can't figure out how to get out of that. Yeah, no problem. So, so this is a, an element on for you know for for better or worse, where R is uh, is trying to be helpful. Is trying to say, oh, you've written a test. You must want to use the testing modules and part that are part of R to do this. You don't actually right now because those testing modules are really for packages. But I'll pull it up and I will show you how you can just run it without having to go through all of that fuss. Hold on, let me get my script out here and then I'll show you. Okay. <clears throat> Share my screen. I think my font size is still reasonable for everybody to see. All right, so this test is going to fail. This is intentionally going to fail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all this code from the top of the let test that library all the way down to my test here. Well, actually, yeah, I'll just run it all. So I'm going to in. So now, if you're on a Mac, it will be Command Return. Command Return. Oh, and it. Hold on. I think I broke some stuff earlier. Yeah, I broke stuff because I changed uh, one of my libraries. But yeah, you should be able, if you're on a Mac, to hit Command Return. And if you're on a PC, I let me see, I can remember this. Um, it's 
Oh, the second key from the left and enter. Yeah. So you won't get this error that I'm getting because I, I made mistakes because I was doing some weird stuff. Um, but that should run it. How did that work? Select it all. Okay, I got a thumbs up. Fabulous. So yeah, so that's one thing you can do. Another thing that you can do if you're so inclined is you can copy this all. So like select it all and hit like control C and then go down to your console and hit control V and enter and it will also run the whole thing. So you can just paste it all into your console all at once. Um, I see a question here. Is Do we have other hands in the room? I see a question from Elliot, if not. So same approach using R Markdown or do you need to use an R script? So in R Markdown, basically if you put stuff in a chunk, a code chunk, so back ticks, R, and then more back ticks, everything inside that chunk will operate just like you run in R console. So you can run the stuff inside there in a chunk. If you're running it in the R Markdown, like open space and you're not inside a chunk, that's markdown life. That's not our console life. And that will be very different. Um, so just make sure that you've got the, the inside the back ticks are back ticks thing and then it should all behave the same. Um, now you understand that closure object is not subset. <laughs> I'm so glad. Yeah, closure is a function and you can't just add subsets. Okay, sorry. I got to get back to Elliot's question because this was a, a good one. So you just wanted to go over the single arrow versus double arrow again, right? Yeah. So for inside the function space here, so let's see you how know, I've got it on screen still. I've got say possible dog equals is, is assigned to false here on this on this line. Make it a little bit bigger. So possible dog false. When I'm assigning this, the co the, the object possible dog only lives inside this this function. If I you know, even if I run that function, if I go down here and say possible dog, no, it doesn't exist. That is not a thing. If I make this a double arrow, and actually I guess the other one too, probably. If I if I if I assign it and and, and the, all of the criteria is met. And now if I run this, the section that I've got highlighted, I run the function, then possible dog would exist. See if I can, I, I could probably actually do this part. I'm sure I haven't broken that. Okay, so now it's doing stuff, but watch. I didn't assign possible dog outside my function. I didn't call this object possible dog. It was created inside the function and sent out into the global environment gotcha. silently. So, so local environment is within the function itself. Global environment is overall. Yes. And in this case, you, you put the double arrow for both true and false, but it only returned true as possible dog. Is there a reason for that? Was it just because it's yes, first? Yes, that's, that's because of, the, of the, the values I passed. Like if, it, if I, I use this if criteria, so once it got to possible dog, oh, it was like if gotcha. that, yeah. and then it got there. And so okay. once it gets there, then it's like, oh, I don't need to do the else stuff because I already got a result. Okay. So it never created the other possible dog, which was it, false. It never, never okay. Thanks. Appreciate it. Of course. Tiffany, a quick question on that. Mm -hmm. uh, added question. Basically, if you saying that it's in a global environment, how long would be that uh, that variable will be until the closing of the session or yep. like a global global or until you until you assign it a, a non a null a, a null value too so you can do this i'm pretty sure and now well actually shoot it didn't disappear did it i thought there's a way i can do that oh, now i'm gonna be confused you can use the remove function. Way, I know you can. I forgot what it is. I'm sorry. You can use the remove function to remove an object. Oh, there you go. Yeah. RM. Yeah, I, I might be in Python brain right now. Sorry. I'm, I'm coming from the SAS world. So just you know, the global and the local. I'm not getting confused with that, but that's okay. SAS is a very different space for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to get confused myself. So that that global is not this global okay sure right global will continue to exist unless you make some sort of change until the session is refreshed or closed and that can be overwritten too right yep. i mean one global, global change can be overwritten by, okay right. 
Janani has has just helpfully posted, by the way, that the the Slack uh, team that for uh, our ladies East Lansing on uh, chat. So be get in there and join if you're interested. I'm on the our ladies for for Chicago, but I'll, I'll try and get on the East Lansing one as well, so we can talk. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. So we usually have discussions, or rather, we would like to have discussions even between meetups. So you can post your questions if you're new to R or help others. If you're already familiar with R, so it's a great place to have interactions with your fellow R colleagues between meetups. Um, do we have any other questions? If not, uh, I would like to th thank Stephanie once again. It was a fantastic workshop. Thank you. I'm and thanks for being great audience. Without your yeah, energy, absolutely. we couldn't have done it. Thank you all. Everybody was everybody was so engaged and enthusiastic. I really, really had a great And time. please sign up for the package development now that you know how yes. to write functions. Don't forget. Now you know what you need to know to make awesome packages. So go for it. Yeah, Mayan is a superstar for our ladies, our open sci, and pretty much everything R. So come and join us. Stephanie has set us right up for that. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend.